Hey, welcome to the show. This is Valentine's Day, so happy Valentine's to you guys. Whatever. Anyway, um, the one thing I'm very much angry about is the fact that the coronavirus has quite literally become political because it's like 9-11, you know, some to that effect. Uh, not to, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that they're the same in regards to that. I'm saying that one party turns it against the other party for political purposes. And I say that because as you see here, Teamsters Union denounces far-right so-called trucker protests. Every single live stream or anything of that nature I see, whether it be on YouTube, Twitter, uh, or um, or uh, not Twitch, um, not TikTok either, um, Instagram, always have truckers who are either helping someone, uh, helping someone, uh, helping someone, whether it be refueling, getting them food, or whatever else the case may be. <clears throat> and then you have local politicians. Of course, local politicians will come up and talk nicely about it. But then you have other people who apparently uh, in the community who actually want them there, like in Ottawa. Apparently there was a letter that was given to the truckers, the organizers of the, tr uh, of the, uh, of the trucker protest. Now, why them there? Because everything is everything was down as far as crime, suicide, uh, drug use, you name it. Because there was such a high presence of a lot of people, apparently, I don't know. But what I do know is, when there was a Republican in office here in the United States, particularly, uh, people were saying how I unfortunately at that, at that time I was, I guess you could say I was kind of supposed uh, uh, corporate left uh, propagandized at that moment uh, until I started really looking into it and really getting involved in the science, the actual science behind the, the protein or the spike protein and what it does to your body and other things like that. Um, so it, I don't, I must, I, I'm politically, I'm an independent socialist. So I don't take anything that mainstream news, mainstream uh, outlets at all, take seriously unless i really look into it and i have to see a pattern of news outlets that are independent that uh that i look into see who owns them i go so deep in with politico political was talking mad, mad stuff about ivermectin and or joe rogan and or you know anybody that is supposedly on the on the right which by the way joe rogan has like uh, millions of times on record saying he's for universal, universal health care, he's for uh, uh, universal college, he's, he's for everything everything the Democrats used to fight for. Well, now they don't because a Democrat's in fucking office. But now he's a far right person. When, wouldn't that change? Oh, yes, when a political party changed office, that's how that happened. So you have someone who is like Trudeau in Canada who is a basically what you call a middle, middle of the ground Republican here that is because he he doesn't sit there and outright uh, do a lot of things he has to you know propagandize a lot of people in Canada from what I can tell but anyway this one's about the about the teamsters now I find this interesting because the teamsters also let's see. Now, in this one, they're, they're, they're claiming that the truckers who, last I checked, were the ones who originated the protest and are literally just protesting mandates. That's all they're doing. They're not, you know, they're not calling for a particular party to be put in office or any of that nature. Nothing, that, nothing like that is about the mandates. Teamsters... Uh, to uh, denounce far right so called trucker protest. Again, I've, I have not seen anything that is far right about them. Uh, you know, that's uh, that the only the, the only outlets that say they're far right are Liberation News, CNN, um, MSNBC, pretty much everything that is 
supposedly left, but it actually turns out to be corporate left because you know they're, they're they are funded by corporations one way or the other. But anyway, see, representing 1.4 million workers, which okay, that just told me that is like basically maybe two three chapters. Uh, but I don't know about that, obviously. But and I put on Twitter asking if this goes for all of Teamsters. I've looked at the one here in Ohio, and there's no mention of this. Nowhere. Let me just kind of go to that one if I can. There is no mention of it whatsoever. The letter to Mike DeWine. Let's see. Da, da, da. Now, obviously, I, I, I did go over this, so. But it does not say anything about that they are against uh, the truckers at all. Nothing. They, they, they don't even. They don't even talk about the truckers in that way. So it's, and to me, this is kind of like how the Green Party came out a few months ago for the mandates. And then you had the independent Green Party, like uh, William Pounce is running for governor in, uh, New, uh, in, uh, in New Zealand for some reason, uh, Arizona, <coughs> who was a part of the independent Green Party. They came out in support of anti-mandates. So they came out, and as far as I'm concerned, on the right side of this, because ever since this whole thing was put in the political sphere, fear mongering, uh, people who were at some point for Medicare for all and all those other stuff, they haven't really talked about it since, as far as I know of. And of course, I stopped watching a lot of the mainstream. Uh, and even independent, I started watching TYT and other, and, other, and other places like that. Um, because they seem like they're bought out now, you know. Um, so anyway, so this is what they say about the about, about the Canadian truckers or the supposed far right Canadian truckers. But yet, let's see, they say real supply chain crisis is a shortage. Uh, is a shortage of companies treating truck drivers with respect. I'm sorry. When was the last time? mandating someone to take a shot was respecting. That's disrespect. So what the truckers are actually doing is standing up for their own rights and not getting a shot. Uh, everybody keeps saying that um, that you get shots when you're a kid. Yeah, well, you don't, you don't have any control over what shots you get as a kid. Your parents are. Two, those same shots have been around for 30, 40, 50 years. Three, they took about 15 years to develop. So there's a lot of contrariness to that whole argument. Let's see. I am considered an independent contractor because I, I own my own truck, but the shipping company controls almost every aspect of my job. Sound familiar, guys? These days, news about the supply chain crisis feels in, uh, in, inescapable. I heard a lot of te- uh, I heard a lot on television about how the holiday season was at risk. See, this is only a few months ago. Was at risk. Shelves are empty, and a COVID nineteen test may be scarce because of a truck truck driver shortage. While dozens of containers ship ships sit without moving outside the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. I have a report on that too, actually. Uh, as truck drivers at the okay, yeah, as a truck driver at the port for the last twelve years, I get it. I've never seen anything like this before. Like many others, I feel a sense of panic looking at long lines uh, of truck dri- uh, truck trucks trying to gain entry into the ports to get goods moving off container ships and into warehouses. But I want you to know that the issues are uh, are issues. Our supply chain is facing weren't um, inevitable. I'll just say that because <laughs> inevitable. Anyway, <laughs> for some reason, even my teeth, I can't, I can't pronounce that right. And they're certainly not because there's a shortage of men and women willing to be truck drivers. The real shortage is a shortage of good union jobs that fairly compensate workers and treat us with the dignity and respect we deserve. To understand the supply chain crisis, you need to understand my life, the life of a port truck driver. 
Now, in this case, it's more or less because of the mandate. It's not, I don't know if it's because of pay or whatnot, but it's, it, it's about the mandate. So that, that part of the story was, uh, you know, according to that, respect and everything else between, uh, respect of, uh, oh, uh, it's, uh, and anyway, body of time, and every, uh, that's the word I was looking for. Every morning I wait to, to get a dispatch te text, which will tell me where I needed to go. My goal is to pick up a container of goods and, and transport it either to a company's warehouse or to a train yard where it will be shipped off to uh, its final destination. So again, the whole story is not about uh, is not about uh, the whole uh, about the story I'm trying to uh, tell here in regards to mandates, but the respect part is there, um, and the reasons for the shortage right now are there is because of mandates, it's because of vaccine mandates. I believe there's been quite a few studies that show that the main uh, victims of COVID are. Uh, people who are unwell in the first place and those who are in the 80s, 90s, whatever else, you know, that sort of thing. Anyway, so let's see. Uh, this little update. Well, let's see. I don't know what time is it. Uh, yeah, okay. Sorry, they, they usually update these pages at like 1230. So let me see. This is another one. Now, I understand that not every person who goes in will come out uh like next day or whatever else sometimes it takes a couple of days so but every couple of days this count goes down this is a seven day a week thing as far as i know about let's see now wait till this thing loads up uh, okay so yes yeah, happy monday and all that good stuff anyway yeah, as you can see, this is a long, long thing. I'll be right back. Well, this is the first time I've looked at percentage changes of, uh, of emissions over time. Everything is down, literally. I mean, I, everything's in the green going down, which is tremendous. This, in my view, I've, I've since covering this, I have never seen like all the green as far as going down, which is really good. Let's see. And ages, all all the above are going down to, as far as like you know, admi uh, patient admittance by age group. Everything's going down. I did have a, a weird discussion with someone on Twitter. Uh, I think yesterday, and they kept they kept pointing to Google. You know, every single time it's like death cases, death cases, or. COVID cases, excuse me, and, and deaths count as well. And even though I would share like as many uh, articles, as many, as much stats as I could in regards to the changes that have been made over the past 24 to 60, you know, 24 to 48 to 72 hours, you just check on with Google. And I'm like, well, you do realize that Google has like two or three different vaccines on the market, you know, through various investments. Every single time I, I, I kept saying something uh, of other stats, even though he, even though they had asked for, if I, if I had any other stats, share it, which I did, three of them. Um, I was like, I finally said, forget it. Some people will just not understand or they only want to understand a certain narrative. Uh, that's why I, that's why I try to look at everything. I'm not perfect. I'm not, I've just never said it was perfect as far as that part goes, but I just try to look at every pattern. I see there's a pattern and I see the honesty behind the pattern. Then I know, okay, that's somewhere I need to go. That's where I, that, that's the information I need to intake. Um, in regards to, See, this is the kind of stuff the reason why I don't I don't cover socialist uh, quote unquote socialist organizations is because they go with a certain narrative. Great, but how true is that narrative, or is that narrative just along with whomever's in office at that time? Because when Trump was in office, all hell all all hell was breaking loose, and they were talking about uh, canceling rent and all stuff. By the way. Do we hear much about canceling rent anymore? I haven't heard anything about it. 
Have we heard anything about raising their wages? Not so much, as far as I know of. I haven't heard any of this. I mean, the only people that still talk about this, kind of, is Jimmy Dore, who who gets crap uh, uh, crap on him as well about about the vaccine and all this stuff, um, and other people at that. So, Liberation News, I'm sorry, but get your get your head out of your butt. Anyway, let's see. Uh, next up, I talk about MMT. Be right back. I would like to bring our attention to the subject of healthcare access in Arizona, a subject I know well, having had several professions in the Arizona healthcare industry. Our healthcare requires more fairness, not less fairness. Our healthcare requires more access, not less access. Billions of Arizona taxpayer money is used to operate our public and private hospitals every year. These hospitals are, therefore, meant to service our healthcare needs with respect for our rights to medical privacy and our rights to all treatment options for public ailments. On the left or on the right, I've never heard a more diabolical advocacy than advocacy against free access to healthcare. On the left, I've heard arguments to prohibit COVID shot refusers from our hospitals. On the right, I've heard defenses of obscene price gouging in our hospitals. They already operate on our taxes. Nationally, 7.8% of people with a credit report as of 2020 had medical debt in collections. This is an outrage given the reality of how our hospitals are government funded, taxpayer funded. The authoritarian left and authoritarian right in Arizona have harrowing agendas that seem to undermine medical privacy and medical liberty. The authoritarian left wants to coerce people into taking underdeveloped drugs made in warp speed. This pursuit has no basis in logic as the shots do not prevent spread for whatever artificial immunity the shots provide. The federal government emboldened mask removal for the jabbed, which led to jabbed individuals being super spreaders. Not that I support forcibly muzzling my constituents. Warp speed, what a name for a pandemic response. The Trump Republican pandemic response. The authoritarian right has criminalized the abortion of genetically defective fetuses thus far in a move to polarize the public masking an anti-medical liberty position with false virtue. In my experience in the caregiving industry, I can say firsthand that our state and federal government don't give a rat's ass about the genetically defective. Developmentally disabled Arizonans suffer lack of funding, lack of trained staff, and lack of adequate services due to either state incompetence or state apathy, or a mixture of both. It is crucial to emphasize that the Arizona Republican passage of SB 1457 was never about helping the genetically defective. It's about control, polarization, and further infringements on our rights to medical privacy. Jab passports and abortion bans have no place among a free, moral people. Denial of health care for drug refusal or lack of financial means has no place among a free, moral people. I'm William Pounds and I'm the independent Green Party candidate for Arizona governor. If this message resonates with you, please consider volunteering and donating to my campaign. This advertisement was paid for by Pounds for Arizona. We do not inherit the earth from our parents. We borrow it from our children. Neither left nor right, simply forward. Hey, and welcome back. Uh, now this is the MMT portion of the show. Uh, I'm not going to put any kind of, you know, snappy, snappy uh, MMT thing. I'm just going to, this just MMT. This is from um, Bebo.EconomicOutlook.net. And this is by, I want to say Bill Mitchell. Uh, it doesn't say it was a buy. Well, for now, let's just go with it. I'll wait until this goes. Okay. 
Yes, Bill Mitchell, as far as the park goes. Last thing uh, policymakers should be thinking about right now is creating a recession. There was a there was an informative article in the UK Guardian over the weekend, uh, July 13th. Uh, Australian supply chain issues likely to continue despite drop in COVID cases, which documented the many ways in which the pandemic has led to difficulties in getting goods supplied uh, to retail outlets or other uh, or their destination in the case of overseas ma- uh, mail deliveries. The majority of recent articles about the economy and public and, and policy options have erred, erred on the side of the need for interest rate hikes, uh, hikes, yeah, hikes and fiscal policy cutbacks, which assume the rising inflation rates around the world are the demand side events. But it's obvious to anyone other than private bank economists who are lobbying for interest rates rises to increase the profits of for their banks or mainstream economists who oppose the central bank bond buying and fiscal deficits that the cause of the problems at present is not being driven by the explosion of nominal spending neither from the non-government sector or through fiscal policy here's here is some more evidence to support that includes a conclusion Excuse me. The UK uh, Guardian article quoted the boss of the Australian Retail Association who said the ongoing shortage of goods available is due to the sheer volume of products and supplies within the global supply chain and a profound shortage of freight space on ships, shipping containers and pallets exacerbated by the limited uh, flights into the country. If the supply contracts at the same time as incomes are largely agreement, contracts at the same time as incomes are largely intact, then it is likely there will be price pressures. But the, but the causality is coming from the abnormal event, the supply constraints. The UK Guardian article also noted the behavior of unregulated cartels who quickly move in to profit when these imbalances occur. All these shipment, uh, all these shipping lines are registered to countries such as Panama, Mexico, the Dominican Republic, and things like that. So they're not really regulated. So essentially, they're modern day pri- pirates at the moment because the prices are not really controlled or regulated by any government. That is an industry policy question rather than a fiscal or monetary policy issue. Further, we know that many distribution centers around the world are in chaos because up to the half of the staff were off work at one time. Uh, all of which tells me that when the uh, abnormal consequences of the pandemic abate, things will settle very, pretty quickly, but not before and before, uh, but not before and before could be several years. The policy advance uh, advice, excuse me, then then is to be patient and not be flustered by the current spikes in inflation rates, especially when the me- mechanisms that would be needed to solidify the supply constraints into a full blown distribution struggle of real shares of national income between workers and capital is not evident yet. One indicator for to watch is the trajectory of personal consumption expenditure, or PCE. I have been following the recent shifts in the U.S. data, given that nation could, seems to be having the highest price levels shifts in the advanced world of, at present. We will get an update from the U.S. Bureau of Economics Analysis for January on February 25th, which will be uh, roughly about a week, about a week and a half to protect. Um, but the last uh, several months provides a guide to what has become uh, what, what has been what, what has been happening. There we go. Let's see. Most recent uh, release, uh, which is personal income and outlays, December twenty twenty one told us that, in quotes, personal income increased 70.7 billion or 3% in December. Disposable personal income or DPI increased 39.9 billion or 2%. And personal consumption expenditure decreased 95.2 billion uh, or 6%. And real PCE decreased 1.0%, goods decreased 3.1%, and services increased 0.1%. 
which just tells me that yeah, people were were indeed paying off bills, not buying shit. Um, anyway, uh, let's see, but also the shift in composition is important to understand. In this blog post, central banks are resisting the inflation panic hype from the financial markets, and we are better off as a result. This was from December of last year. I noted that both the productive and spending sides of economic interest to create an inflation episode, inflationary episode. But the important point is to understand how that interaction changes to motivate a shift from stable prices to rising prices and then accelerating prices. I showed that the pandemic, which is highly unusual, uh, which is a highly unusual event by any stretch, has created a major imbalance in the relationship between spending and production. The pandemic did three things in this context. First, the government stimulus payments, though imperfect, helped maintain income and spending capacity among households. Second, the lockdown prevented consumer spending on services by, the, by and large, hospitality, entertainment, travel, etc. And with income still intact, the spending shift to goods, produ uh, production, renovation, gadgets, flat screen TVs, you name it. Households brought uh, forward spending plans on some goods, per some goods purchases, while normal spending patterns were short-circuited by the inability to spend on services. Third, the lockdowns and health concerns also reduced the capacity of the goods producing sector, goods producing center to meet the new demand. This is what we are referring to when we talk about supply-side bottlenecks. If workers are locked down, getting sick and uh, getting sick and ports and freight terminals are disrupted. The normal smooth supply chain is disrupted or interrupted, excuse me, and so there are inventory shortfalls, delivery delays, and the like. Then overlay market power, which allows producers, over uh, wholesalers, and retailers to profit gouge the shortage via markup increases, and you see the problem. So there has been a fairly rapid shift in spending patterns towards goods demand as service demand fell, while the supply side for goods uh, adduction has not been able to meet that uh, shift quickly enough, and there have been massive buildup of excess capacity in service sector. As I have previously noted, I am surpri surprised the inflationary pressure had not been greater given this combination of events. But I still argue that these spending shifts and production constraints will give, give away once we move beyond the uh, pandemic. And you can see that happening a bit, uh, 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 happening a, a bit already. Okay. Uh, okay, so there's a graph here for those who are listening of the nominal and real PCE monthly growth percent. Okay, so let's see. April, uh, let's see. Uh, well, there, there are, okay, so real PCE is up um, almost uh, about halfway to 1.0%, while the nominal PCE is up a little bit, uh, is a little bit past 1.0%. 1, 1 and then there is uh, a sharp turn in September 20, uh, 2021 in the nominal PCE, which Looks like it's just above 0.5%, uh, and the real one, the real PCE is lower than 0.5%, uh, roughly, it looks like between one, and no, sorry, uh, 0 0.2 to 3%. Basically, everything that I just explained, what, what was actually, you know, going on as far as the part goes. And yeah, there was more consumer spending, um, I believe. Uh, no, uh, yeah, consumer income uh i believe in december so yeah that was christmas and all that stuff anyway uh the next graph okay anyway to get more of this you can go to bilbo.economicoutlook.net slash blog blah 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 let's see yeah uh i want to get to other things involving that let's see where are we at on this there's a money market thing Right. Is it the another political thing here? For those who are seeing this, uh, 
got a little opinion about this. Everybody was bitching about Miss McConnell um, having his wife. Uh, I can't remember if she was transpor- uh, transportation secretary or interior secretary, one of the two. Uh, but everybody on the left, cor- corporate left, um, was bitching about about her being a part of that and bitching about Ivanka and everybody else in between. Nobody's saying shit as far as I can see about Sarah Bloom Raskin, who is the wife of Jamie Raskin, who is a senator. I mean, okay, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I'm a, I am an actual leftist. I'm an actual socialist as far as that part goes. So I'm, I'm going to look at both sides, and I'm trying not and – now I'll try very hard not to be uh, hypocritical because there, there will be some times where I'm like, well, you know, that kind of thing. But in this case, no. Like, you, both sides have to you know, be fair and bitch about each other's shit. Otherwise, there's, it's, it's, all, it's all BS. Um, anyway, so – Evidently, uh, let's see, by nominee, uh, I, I, okay, yeah, first of all, I think she was confirmed, uh, but anyway, so let's see, Sarah Bloom Raskin, President Biden's pick to be the Fed's bank regulator, called a Kansas City Fed President Esther George in 2017 to advocate for a fintech company, according to Republican Senator uh, Pat Toomey, who more likely is... The usual as far as politicians, very corrupt himself. Um, let's see. The, fin, the, the firm Reserve Trust had been denied special access to the central bank's payment system. Raskin was a, was a Reserve Trust board member at the time. After Raskin's personal intervention on behalf of Reserve Trust, the Kansas City Fed approved the company's re, uh, second request of an account in 2018. To me, in a letter sent to the uh, Kansas City Fed, said George herself revealed to him that R- Raskin made a 2017 call to advocate for the Reserve Trust. This is why you should never. This is why you should never uh, vote Democrat or Republican, uh, or PSL or Green Party, or you know, as far as like the the National Green Party types, you know, that sort of thing. I'm sorry, but yeah, Independent Green Party, they sound they sound pretty good to me. But anyway, that, neither here nor there. Uh, anyway, so Sarah Bloom Raskin, President Joe Biden's pick to, 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 to be the Federal Reserve Bank's regulator, I don't know how you can be a regulator when you're doing that, called Kansas City Fed President Esther George 2017 to advocate for, yeah, okay, I already read that crap, at the time, Reskin had just joined the board of the firm Reserve Trust. The fintech company, like many others, had helped the Fed with grant it access to a master account. Earlier in 2017, Raskin left, uh, had left her role as the Treasury Department's Deputy Secretary prior to her Treasury work. She spent more than three years at the Federal Reserve as one of its governors. So obviously she had a lot of influence. Uh, after Raskin's uh, personal in- intervention on behalf of Reserve Trust, the Kansas City Fed approved the company's second request for an account in 2018. The Kansas City Fed claims that its reversal was not the result of Raskin's call. BS. Uh, to me, uh, Republican Pennsylvania, in a letter sent to the Kansas City Fed, said George herself revealed to him that Raskin made the 2017 call directly to George to advocate for the... Okay, I read this stuff. Uh, on the evening of February 2nd of this year, uh, you and your staff, uh, does some quotes, spoke with my staff to me, told George in his letter. On that you call, uh, on, on that you call, you revealed that Miss Raskin had, a, uh, had, in fact, personally called you about Reserve Trust Master Account application uh, after it have been denied a master account application, not like MasterCard. Uh, the letter from Toomey, the ranking member on the Senate Banking Committee, uh, came more than a week after Raskin was grilled by Senate Republicans during her confirmation hearing to become the next Fed Vice Chairman for his provision of replacing Randall Quarles. Senator Cynthia Loomis, also a Republican uh, from Wyoming, asked Raskin several times whether she had lobbied on behalf of, of a reserve trust. Uh, Raskin re- repeatedly refused to answer the question at the public hearing. 
Okay. She later told to me in a letter this week that she did not recall making any outreach on behalf of the reserve trust to help it uh, get approval for its master account. But she also told him that had I done so, I would have abided by all applicable ethics rules in such communications. Yeah, if you did, if you did, if you did, if you didn't make a phone call, you wouldn't have to add those to your sentence. But anyway. Let's see, Raskin, who received equity in Reserve Trust when she joined its board, sold her financial stake upon her 2019 departure from the company for about four, about 1.5 million. To this day, Reserve Trust's exclusive master account remains the company's single largest selling point to potential customers. It is the first thing the company says about itself on the homepage of its website. Reserve Trust, in quotes, is the first fintech trust company with a Federal Reserve Master Account, reads the homepage for reservetrust.com. In quotes, we provide payment services that financial institutions and fintechs have previously only have, have only been able to obtain from correspondence and sponsored banks. Uh, Toomey's letter to George opens by uh, opens up by accusing the city, the Kansas City Fed, of continuing stonewalling of reasonable requests for information, which he called unacceptable. I think both parties actually do that damn thing. The letter says the George, the, the George, that George has refused to provide evidence that the uh, the regional uh, Fed Bank's decision to reverse course on the company's request was not based on Raskin's lobbying, but because of a change of circumstances in the status status yeah status of Reserve Trust business model and another factor. Oh, and another factor. Hmm, I wonder if that's the lobbying part of it. The Kansas City Fed said this week that it decided to grant Reserve Trust master account application after the company it changed its business model and account in the Colorado Division of Banking uh, reinterpreted the state's law in a manner that meant Reserve Trust met the definition of a depository institute. So that just tells me that they paid other politicians in Kansas to change that law. Anyway. Anywho, let's see. <clears throat> I hope you guys get the picture on that one. Let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Maybe I should save this for tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to read, um, what is this again? Skeptic Guide to Modern Monetary Theory. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to read through this and get some finer points on it. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, yeah, <laughs> fine. Uh, Trudeau plans to invoke Emergencies Act in response to protest sources. Right. Let's see, they've already sat there and shut down the GoFundMe, which last I checked was not actually a part of the jurisdiction. But anyway, um, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, oops, Justin Trudeau, god dang it. <laughs> There we go. Has told his caucus he would he will invoke the never before used emergency act to give the federal government extra power to handle anti-vaccine mandate protests across the country. This source, uh, those sources who were not authorized to speak publicly, no kidding, said the prime minister informed the, pre the premiers of his decision this morning. The Emergency Act, which replaces the war measures at the Act at the 1980s, uh, in the 1980s, should be defines a national emergency as a temporary, urgent, and critical situation. Temporary is never temporary; it's always like forever shit. Uh, urgent and critical situation that seriously endangers the lives, health, or safety of Canadians, and is and is of such proportions. Or natural and our nature as to exceed the capacity or author authority of the pro, uh, the province to deal with it. It gives special powers to the prime minister resp to respond to emergency scenarios affecting public wel welfare, national disaster, disease outbreaks, public order, civil unrest, international emergencies, or war emergencies. The Act grants cabinet the, uh, the 
the Antichrist's cabinet the ability to take special temporary measures that may not be appropriate in normal times. To cope with an urgent and critical situation and the resulting fallout, it is still subject to the protection of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Once a cabinet declares an emergency, it takes effect right away, but the government still needs to go to Parliament within seven days to get approval. That's one thing we should have fucking done. Anyway, and either if either the Commons or the Senate votes against the motion, the emergency declaration is revoked. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh said Monday that he, while he sees the Prime Minister's decision to turn to the Emergency Act as a proof of failure or leadership, he will support the declaration, which should secure his patches to a minority uh, parliament. The reason why we got to this point is because the Prime Minister let the siege in Ottawa go on, the, on for weeks and weeks without actually doing anything about it, allowed the convoy to shut down borders without responding appropriately, he said. Okay. Legal threshold questioned. Jack Lindsay, an associate professor in the Applied Disaster and Emergency Studies Department uh, at Brandon, University in Manitoba said one of the first steps in invoking the emergency uh, act is the government showing that state of emergency exists. They're going to have to basically prove that first hurdle, that is a national emergency, he said. He's basically going to be arguing that truckers are basically creating a threat to security of Canada, but it's not at all. The truckers are protesting. This is a way to stop their protesting. This is a way to uh, stop them from being able to accept donations. This is a way to make them submit to the to the, to the government in regards to that. And nobody should be prevented from protesting. The economy is already fucked because the mandates keep exports and imports at a very slow pace to the point where the economy is affected. These guys are not affecting anything. They are expressing, uh, I'm guessing a right that they would have in Canada, just like the truckers here in the United States would have a right to protest. Uh, it all depends on what party is in charge. You know, what the Republicans can do, the Democrats are doing. What the Democrats aren't doing, the Republicans will do. And that's how shit happened. That's what happened in the Clinton administration uh, here because the Republicans couldn't uh, initialize globalization of businesses and couldn't put together all the insurance companies and loan and uh, and pay loan places and banking uh, industry and all that stuff in one basket. But because Clinton decided to have the all the Democrats vote to repeal Glass-Steagall. That made that happen. And because that happened, global trade boomed and a lot of jobs went overseas to the cheaper places, Mexico's, the China's, the Japan's, whatever the fuck the case may be. I have seven day one on the on trade, but every country should have their own version of that. The free market is there to see there's demand for certain products and if those demands are there so be it if not those products fade away and those companies go into bankruptcy or whatever the fuck they do so anyway so i think that this would be a over overstretching of power just like i thought doing that uh for the vaccine was overstretching the, uh, of the of the powers here and trump allowed that so i mean I thank Trump for, for at least one thing, and that is for being so outwardly corrupt that he literally showed the corruption of the Democratic Party, uh, the Republican Party, which we already knew they were. We already knew that both parties are pretty much corrupted, but now we know they both are as corrupt as the other one, and neither one want anybody else to vote for anyone as far as either party. And so that's why right now they're setting things up for the Republicans to get back in office. And then the Republicans are setting things up for Democrats to get back in office and blah, 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 blah. 
if you want change, either you don't vote to show you your protest vote or non vote in that case, or you get uh, with your local open primary organization that is trying to get open primaries in your state on the ballot and have people who are, who want change to vote for that and have that become an actual uh, legislative law. Uh, also, uh, ranked choice uh, paper ballot vote. I used to say ranked choice vote, but someone actually p rightly pointed out that ranked choice voting, if you do it in the uh, machine voting, as they, as they do in lots of different states that are easily uh, manipulated, uh, that's not going to help matters. So I think every state should go to paper ballots, and I think that those paper ballots should have ranked choice voting on them. That way, there's more of a chance of a democrat democracy, dem a democratic, no pun intended, the party itself, democratic uh, system and process. Anyway, and uh, if you do actually want to learn the right way of economics, not the normal way, in, at least in my view, because the 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 article I read from Bill Mitchell from Bill Mitchell earlier is what I've been saying. Uh, this whole time since the pandemic started and since we got money and all this other shit. And the reason why I know all that before I read that was because I started I started learning modern monetary theory and how the economy actually works, not just ma microeconomics, macroeconomics and trends and stuff of that nature. Um, anyways, so yes, hashtag learn MMT. Uh, I would go on to uh, Real Progressives, I think it's .org or .com, whichever. Uh, I, I forget which one, but follow them on Twitter. Uh, follow me here on either Anchor if you're listening to us, uh, or on Rumble if you're watching this, or on YouTube if you're also watching this. Either way, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe. Um, please support in any way you can. and. If, if the mainstream media is telling you one thing, always look for the other and for the other side of things because more than not, if they are, if it's a party related shit, both parties are fucked. So I would suggest that you just go independent and vote for and vote for the policies you actually want, and not for the party that wants you to vote for them. So anyway, thanks for watching, listening, subscribe. Go to my PayPal.me slash couple of leftists, a couple of GAP network um, to donate whatever you want as far as the part goes, or you can pay $1.99 I think it is, uh, to be a um, member on my anchor, uh, anchor.fm slash just Calvin I talk about whatever, uh, or uh, yeah, anyway, so all that shit uh, yeah, peace out for now thanks for watching, and again, happy Valentine's Day Oh, yes, and I want to say happy Valentine's to my fiance. I'll just say that. Peace out for now. Hi, uh, my name is James Kahn. Uh, people call me Hank, and I am from running for United States Senate in the state of California. I am running as a Green Party candidate. When you think about people like Kamala Harris, and you think of people like Elizabeth Warren or Joseph Biden, and you think about the campaign promises that they made and aren't true now, such as Medicare for All, abolishing student debt, the children that sit at the borders, and these horrible things, and you think to yourself, it's been 11 months, and you know, these are promises that are not kept. I am a Green Party candidate, and people always ask me about my opposition, I say, well, in a world where the only other candidates are green, and the only other politicians are green, what would I provide to you? What would any green provide to you? They would build a world away from oil. They would have, and I have, a platform that is about saving and establishing the environment for future, future generations, the environment above all else. Behind me, I am in the redwood forest in Northern California. These trees were once a thousand years old and two thousand years old. We only see trees now that are maybe 50 to maybe 200 years old. But think of all these great giants that they came up on and just chopped down and they said okay we stopped but it's going to take a thousand years for them to reestablish everything we destroy now does not reestablish so we must act today please vote green and I am a green party of candidate my name is Hank Kahn and I am running for US Senate and 2022